think I've just experienced one of the most notable glitch in the matrix or even maybe a spirit. It has me a little baffled and a little shook up. I have listened to other stories with awe. I can recall a few times where I've had a so-called glitch, but this time it really sunk in. And it being the month of October, it is said to be the time when spirits are most active. To me, they seem active all the time, but I do feel more so the extra presence within this month. Maybe it's because more people are willing to be more open-minded about it during spooky season. Those who don't entertain their ghostly indulgences unless it's October. Just a theory though. Now on to what actually happened to make me sit down and write this out. I live in the middle of nowhere, and this is important to know. Most people need their GPS to find my home. I do, however, have two neighbors and my mother who live in this area. You know, others who value the seclusion, along with a few family members, as this area has been in my family for nearly a century. My mother has a camper that she lets some of the lesser fortunate crash for a night or two, or maybe even a week. We do have a few drifters who set up camp in the deeper forested area of our property. Usually we don't mind unless they start stealing or leaving drug paraphernalia all around. And we're not talking weed, more like meth and syringes. When we had a veteran who served and was injured in Iraq, he had a little bit of brain trauma from an explosive device that was activated and left shards in his skull. His name is Corey. He's different, but very nice. So my mom decided to allow him room and board. For the past year, he has rented out her camper. Corey is around the same age as I am, maybe a little younger. He always seemed to take an extra interest in me. I think it's because I'm kind and patient, especially with someone who is adjusted to life with a disability. He would go out of his way to make sure that I came home from work every single night. Sometimes he would open up my door to the car, just to be a gentleman. Then he met my husband, and I quickly realized it may have been a crush on his part. As soon as my husband came outside, Corey stiffened up. His chest bowed out, and his arms hung by his side in the ready stance, bouncing with anticipation. My husband then comes over. His chest is bowed out, and he goes, What's up, man? Can I help you? To which Corey says, No. Can I help you? And they're almost touching chest at this point, and I quickly break up the tension by introducing the two. My husband catches the eyes I'm making at him and backs down. He was aware of our new neighbor and his mental situation. He knew that Corey wasn't really computing until after I did the introductions. Problem solved, I wish. Corey would still take any given opportunity to show his affections towards me. He was never really creepy about it, just seemed innocently lost on the whole I am happily married subject. This would lead to me getting bouquets of flowers every single week, at work and at home. Some days he would call my son to give him flowers to give them to me. The only creepy thing he ever did was hide in my bushes and watch me leave twice. The second time my husband approached him kindly, Corey said he was playing hide and seek, alone. Okay, again. He has cognitive issues and all, but never was aggressive. Now to what actually happened. It had been two weeks and no Corey, no flowers, and no one waiting for me to get home other than my own family. I asked my mother and she said that she thinks he was with his friends for the week, but it was very odd that she hadn't seen him. So fast forward a day or two. I heard a knock at the door and I opened it. My husband was at work and his truck wasn't there. Corey is on my porch and I kind of watch him. He has a bouquet of purple daisies and baby's breath. I start to open the door to greet him, but this time, he just left them on the porch and ran, and I mean took off running. Figured he just didn't want to get caught, so I go to call my mom and let her know that Corey is back. And this is where everything went bam, and I was shook. Hey mama, uh, I just saw Corey, he left more flowers and he, she cut me off. That is not possible, sweetheart. I have some really bad news. Corey died the day after he left here in Wilmington. It was a bad accident, and he died on the scene. I am vibrating. My nerves are not ready. I am physically holding these flowers in my hand as she is saying this. I smell his cologne all over the front porch. I was on my way to put them in water in my daughter's room. I dropped them by accident and picked them back up. 
still again asking my mother if she was sure. She then screenshotted the obituary. Corey B. September 14th, 2022. DOA. Car accident. Along with all his information from his family that he still kept in touch with. I don't tell people my address. I like being secretive and protecting my family from certain things and certain people to be more precise. Who was that? I saw Corey with my own eyes. I watched him nervously and then I still smelled his cologne lingering. My mother, who was very doubtful, promptly came over to see and she was just as taken aback. The little card even has a heart drawn on it that said CB on the tag. Corey died last month. How is this possible? And no, I don't have any admirers that I'm aware of and would know where I live and look, sound, and smell like Corey did. I still have the flowers. Some are wilting. That happens in time. Now, how did time reverse itself in order for him to give me the last gift of these flowers? It's definitely got my mom, my husband, and myself all questioning what went on that day. It's just so sad and so crazy at the same time. This happened years ago, but the thought of it still keeps me up at night. I was walking through the hills of a provincial park with my dog during the winter. The sun set much faster than I expected, and well before I could get back to my car. Once the sun was gone, all I could see was darkness. I was walking slowly through a field when, out of nowhere, I had to this day the most gut-wrenching, undeniable feeling that I was being watched. I turned around and in the distance, I saw a figure just standing there, darker than the night sky around us. The instant I saw him, my stomach dropped, my body literally froze, and I knew in that moment, somehow, that he was coming for me. I grabbed my dog's leash and we booked it. I mean full on sprinting, full speed up and down hills, around trees and down embankments. I was running so fast as if my life depended on it, and to this day I'm still sure that it was. I make that 30 to 45 minute trip in 10, and all that stands before me in my car is this switchback you have to go back and forth up if you want to reach the top. So once again, I'm giving it all I got running up the switchback as fast as I possibly can. Once I reached the top, I turned around and looked down. And who else but that same person still chasing me. But does he go back up the switchback like any sane person would? Of course not. He started sprinting right up the middle of the switchback, headed straight for me. I scream at him. Fuck off! He doesn't say anything. Not a single word. Just continues running straight at me. I am so lucky that my car was at the top of that hill, because as I ran towards it, just like in a horror movie, I dropped my keys and are fiddling with them trying to open up the door. Just in time I get the door open, throw my dog in and shut it behind me, just as the guy reaches us. Best part is there were no other vehicles parked anywhere around us. But where did this person park? Yeah, right next to me, of all places. Now this guy literally jumps into his truck just as fast, and to this day, I have still never seen a better example of speeds out of there like a bat out of hell. He guns the engine so hard, black smoke is blasting out the back as he swerves out of there, leaving skid marks behind him. I sat in the back of my vehicle for hours afterwards, shaking and crying, knowing I was this close to whatever he had planned for me. So that's why I'm sharing this story, in hopes that people won't ignore that gut feeling. That little voice in the back of your head that tells you to run. If I ignored it that day, I never would have noticed him in time. And I would not have had the head start that I needed to escape. Always trust your gut feelings and intuition. It might really be the deciding factor in if it's your final day on earth or not. This is an old story, something that happened to me almost 20 years ago when I was 23. I was writing for a popular budget travel guidebook series and mainly worked in Central and Eastern Europe. 
Depending on the time of the year, I could be gone for several weeks or even several months at a time. I mainly traveled alone. I'd run into a few problems here or there, but my experiences were predominantly positive. I'd been working in the former Yugoslavia and was now on my way to the Czech Republic from Sarajevo. It's a long journey by train, so I broke it up into several overnight stops. Zagreb so first and then Budapest, making each leg around eight hours. It was late January and bitter. It was probably a good seven inches of snow on the ground, perhaps even more in some places. I was exhausted in battling the remnants of the flu I'd picked up and split. I left Zagreb in the late afternoon and expected to reach Budapest by around 10 p.m. I bought my ticket in the travel center in the train station. When I boarded the car, about half the compartments were empty, but there were definitely other people on it. Since the train wasn't crowded, I managed to find a compartment to myself, so I spread out a bit and prepared for the long ride. The first part of the ride was smooth. I worked on some guidebook stuff, wrote in my journal, etc. However, a few hours into the ride we passed over the Hungarian border and things started to go awry. I heard them before I saw them. They were a group of teen boys, about five of them that I could see, and they were loud. I could hear them running through the train car, laughing and cursing and banging on the compartment walls. They were loud and obnoxious, but it's not like the first time I've ever been annoyed by a group of teenagers. I didn't look up and kept working on my writing, but as time went on, they grew louder and louder. As they ran from car to car, they slid the train doors open with so much force that it sounded like a bomb going off every few minutes. And then the sounds got louder. And that's when I noticed they were standing outside my compartment, looking in on me. I could only see three of them through the small window, but there were definitely more than that. I had seen them earlier. I glanced up at them, frowned, and then looked away. I learned that the best way to deal with that kind of thing was just to ignore them. I didn't want to encourage their behavior, but ignoring them seemed to have the opposite effect. Girl! Girl! They hollered at me. Come have fun! My compartment door was closed, but they proceeded to mess with me by slowly opening it and pretending they were going to come in, then shutting it again. I went from chanting, girl, girl, to a much more ominous, we're going to f*** tonight, and you f*** us all, followed by a bunch of slang words for female body parts. Some of the more universal ones I had no trouble understanding. At this point, I grew very nervous. How was I to know whether they were just messing around with me or serious? Couldn't exactly leave. To do so would mean walking through them. And they were blocking my entrance and my exit. And then one pulled out a pocket knife. He stuck out his tongue and ran the blade across it. And then pointed at me and grinned. The guy next to him made sexual hand gestures towards me and laughed. I tried not to show anything, but in my mind... I was quickly taking stock of what items I absolutely had to take with me if I made a break for it. My lack of reaction angered the one with the knife, so we switched from licking it to using it to penetrate the circle he'd made with his thumb and forefinger. You like? He called out. Part of me figured that they couldn't really do anything. There were other people on the train car after all, and they would hear me scream. Surely someone would come and help me, right? The conductor hadn't come through since we did the border crossing so he was due for another trip as well. I figured I only had to get through the next few minutes and they'd get bored and leave. It was at this point that I noticed a curtain on the door window. I know it sounds crazy, but that's when I lost it. I'd left the curtain open so that people walking by could see the compartment was occupied. But now, all I could think that if they came in, all they'd have to do was pull the curtain and nobody walking past would see what they were doing to me. At least one of them had a knife they all were taller and bigger than me, and they outnumbered me. I started to tear up. Would they kill me? Would I seriously be maimed? I was 23 years old and a late bloomer. I also had a history of sexual assault. I'd only had consensual sex for the first time a year earlier. I feared rape more than death, and I feared pain. My day pack was in my lap, and the only things I had in there for weapons were fingernail files and a butter knife. I reached into my bag and fumbled around until I had one in each hand. Just as they slid the door open and the first guy stepped inside, the knife pointed at my crotch. Another voice filled the corridor. 
I didn't need to speak the language to hear the anger. The guys ran from my compartment, one dropping the knife, and I watched as a middle-aged man dressed in blue stomped after them. A few seconds later, the train came to a grinding stop. The world outside was creepy. All I could see was snow and blackness. There were no lights in sight. After a few seconds, the train started back again. And thankfully, the boys didn't return. I was just starting to feel some relief when the man in black returned to my compartment. He was a conductor. English? He asked, and I nodded. I made them leave. They're gone. When I was a kid growing up in a very small town in the 80s and 90s, my parents often left me and my little sister home alone for a few hours at a time, just to run errands. My mom had two brothers, and we lived in the same town as one of her brothers and his family. Being a close-knit family, my cousins and I were always over at one another's houses. The adults would leave us alone a lot back then, and it was standard to tell the kids, don't open up the doors for anybody and just don't use a stove and we never thought anything about it. After my parents divorced, it happened a lot more often as both my parents worked different shifts at their jobs. My sister and I lived in a town and my cousins and grandma lived outside of town with only a few neighbors nearby. So my sister and I kinda got the best of both worlds. City kids and country kids. Because we lived in such a small community, everyone knew everyone else. And I think we all felt perfectly safe that nothing bad would ever happen. Around the time I was 8 or 9 years old, I began to get strange phone calls. It would be a man's voice on the phone, and these calls would always come when I was home alone. This person would tell me they could see me, and they knew I was alone. That they were coming to get me. When I get these calls, I would usually just hang up without saying anything. Of course, it terrified me, but I was too scared to tell my parents. I was terrified of these phone calls, but I also liked getting to stay home alone and being left to take care of my sister made me feel grown up. And I didn't want my parents to stop leaving me in charge. So, stupidly, I kept the calls to myself. One day while my dad was at work, my cousin, who was a year older than me, was at my house. We were watching TV and playing when the phone rang. She answered it, and her face went pale. She hung up and started crying. I immediately asked her what was wrong. She shook her head, saying... I can't tell you. I pressed, and she finally told me about how this man would call her a lot when she was home alone, always telling her he knew she was by herself and he was going to come get her. I was completely shocked, and I explained that I'd been getting those same calls, and we immediately agreed that it had to be one of her older brothers or their friends playing some kind of mean joke on us. So we calmed down and kind of just laughed it off. I didn't get another call for a while after that, so I almost forgot about it. Until the summer between my 6th and 7th grade year. My grandma had taken a part-time job and my mom lived in another town. So my sister and I were home alone almost all day every day while my dad worked. We spent our days outside playing in the yard, riding bikes around the neighborhood and tanning in our backyard a lot. One day my sister was gone to a friend's house and my cousin was back at my house. We were listening to music and dancing around the living room when the phone rang. I picked it up and there it was, the same voice. At this point I was 12 years old and had developed a little bit of an attitude. When the man told me he knew we were home alone, I laughed and said, liar. He waited a moment and said, I can prove I know you're alone. I laughed again, a little more nervously this time, and said, oh yeah? Then do it. His response was, I love that little yellow tank top you're wearing today. By this time, my cousin had turned off the music and was just watching me, so she saw when the color drained out of my face. I was freaking out. I had just gotten a new outfit and was wearing it. A yellow tank top and jean shorts with the matching yellow and pink patches. I yelled, Leave us alone! Slammed the phone down with my heart racing. I began crying and told my cousin it was him. He knows we're here by ourselves. I ran over to shut the living room curtains and my cousin said, I think we should call somebody. I agreed, but instead of calling the police, she picked up the phone and tried to call her mom at work. 
We got no answer. So I called my dad's work and left a message with the guard gate to have him call me. As we were debating what to do next, I heard the gravel in our driveway crunch under the wheels of a vehicle. I ran to the window and peeked out to see a small red car sitting in our driveway, and I didn't recognize the man and woman inside it. In our tiny little town, even if I didn't know someone's name, I'd surely at least know their face. But I didn't know either of them. I froze with fear as I watched them talking to one another, and my cousin ran to lock the back door. We had no weapons and no real way to try and defend ourselves, other than a softball bat, which was outside on the carport. As my cousin came back into the room, she hissed, We have to hide. My cousin hid in a small space between the tall bookshelf and the wall, and I threw myself behind our recliner, which faced the window. I watched in horror as the woman walked up to our front door. Instead of knocking, she tried the knob. I tried to quiet my breathing, convinced she might be able to hear me, and watched her shadow through the curtains as she walked around to our carport. Sure enough, I heard the doorknob jiggle, then there was a pause, and the door shook as if someone was trying to force it open. I covered my mouth and forced myself not to scream. After what felt like an eternity, the sound stopped and everything went quiet. I was too afraid to move, so I just waited. I have no idea how much time passed, but eventually we heard the car backing out of the driveway. Once I got the courage, I ran to peek out the window again, to make sure that they had really left. I saw no trace of the red car, but I was still racked with fear. I told my cousin she could come out now, and we hugged each other in relief. Even though we were scared to go outside, we decided to get on our bikes and ride to the office my aunt worked in. Once we were there, we told her everything, the phone calls and how long they'd been happening, the red car, and then gave a description of both of the people inside. She immediately called the police, and we had to give our statements about it all. When my dad got home from work, he asked me why I'd called the gate guard, and my aunt filled him in on everything. And from that moment on, we were no longer able to stay by ourselves again until I was probably around 16. We never heard anything else on this case, and we never got any more phone calls again either. It's been years and I still think about that situation. We never found out who made those calls or who those people were in the red car. The phone calls could have just been some mean prank and those people could have just been trying to simply rob the house or something. But the coincidence that day was just too crazy. I have no idea if the man kept watching us at all as we grew up, but the whole thing definitely made me paranoid about a lot of things. And I always make sure to keep a weapon near me at all times when I'm home alone. Now, as a single mom, I'm forced to leave my kids alone occasionally, and I am overly protective with them, giving tons of instructions and rules about what they can and can't do. They may roll their eyes at me, but I know the dangers of this world, and I'd rather be safe than sorry. So to the man and that couple in the red car, let's never ever meet. My boyfriend is a trucker, and I went trucking with him for two months. One night, we decided to stay at his company's terminal. Life on the road is hard, especially if you're a feminine woman like myself. So I took advantage of the terminal's free showers. That night, as my boyfriend slept, I went to take a shower and heat up some ramen in their lounge. When I arrived, many different people were there. I showered and finished up and then went to the lounge for my dinner. As I waited for my ramen to cook, I noticed this man and his friend just staring at me. I didn't make eye contact. I didn't make eye contact with anybody, in fact. I scanned the room, watched TV, then watched the microwave. But still, they kept staring. I sat at a table in front of them that had a table between us. I ate my ramen and sat on my phone. I'd occasionally look up. Most of the people were men, but I saw at least two other women. At one point, I hear crunchy noises next to me and... Chips with your soup? It was the man's friend offering tortilla chips and I politely declined. Not only do tortilla chips not go with ramen, but why would I accept open food from a complete stranger? I was so focused on my phone that I didn't check my surroundings. Time flew. I was already in there for an hour. I began to gather my things and then realized I was alone. Besides that creeper, 
I was freaked out, and nothing really truly scares me. Didn't know whether to stay in the lounge or run back to my boyfriend's truck. So I went to leave, and the man also got up to leave, all while still staring at me. I walked towards where we parked and felt so relieved when I saw not only another trucker walking towards the lounge, but also an employee. The creeper ended up walking ahead of me, only to turn around because he had to throw something out. I ran back to my boyfriend's truck and double checked to make sure those doors were locked. Did that man think I was a lot lizard? I live in a city located inside a valley, with a lot of smaller towns up the hills and the mountains around. So it's part of the local culture for teenagers and young adults to visit these smaller areas during the winter, to drink, smoke weed, and basically just hang out with their friends. My uncle bought a house in one of these areas, so eventually, I decided to get the keys and spend a weekend there with five of my friends. The house had two big bedrooms, with three beds in each, and a lot of extra mattresses. At night, we decided at some point to go back inside and just chill and watch TV. But since the living room had no sofas yet, we bought some mattresses from the bedrooms and just used those. One of my friends, Victor, decided to go outside and smoke. After a few minutes, we heard someone knocking at the window just behind us. Everyone got kind of scared for a second, but then quickly realized, oh, it has to be just Victor. But since we're sitting on mattresses close to the ground, it wasn't really easy to see clearly who was actually at the window. And since the person just stood there looking straight at one of the girls, I got up to check. I then saw a man who somehow looked a lot like my friend, but a bit more fat and a lot older. I quickly came to the conclusion that it was a stranger. I froze while looking at him and him looking straight back at me. And then I said, it's not Victor. Everyone else also froze. Everyone just sat there waiting for a reaction. All I could think to ask was what he wants. He just stood there for a second and then asked, There's a bar nearby. We need a drummer to play in our band. Is any of your friends a drummer by chance? Oddly enough, I actually was a drummer. But I just told him no. He took a few extra long seconds just staring at us. Then he left. My friend came back and we made fun of the situation, just making jokes on how it was messing with us. A little later on, most of the group decided to sleep in one bedroom and leave the second for me and one of the girls since they saw us kissing earlier. We all go to bed. A few hours later, I wake up to the girl shaking me in horror, whispering that she heard something coming from the kitchen. I get up and tell her to lock the bedroom. As I leave to go check, I'm thinking to myself, I am that moron who dies first in any horror film. As I pass the second bedroom, I thought about calling out to someone to join me, but I see that they're all sleeping. I hear something at the kitchen's window, so I quickly move in there as silently as I can. As I'm grabbing a knife to defend myself, I hear the door open right in front of me. It was the same man from earlier. For about five to ten seconds, we both just stood and stared at each other. While still holding the door handle, he made a slow movement with the other hand towards something underneath his shirt, which I assumed was probably a gun or a knife. I also lifted my hand showing him the knife, and he immediately stopped. The kitchen was really small, so we were actually standing pretty close to one another. As our eyes stayed locked on one another, we had this unsaid agreement, and we both knew it was going to end badly if he tried anything. I just shook my head, and as calm as I could, whispered, Don't. He just kept staring at me for a little bit longer, and then finally, shut the door and went away. Breathed a sigh of relief, went back and told the girl it was nothing and that we should just go back to bed. I didn't sleep that night, and we left early in the morning and I made sure to ask my uncle and cousins if they ever had any weird visits there. They told me the only person who ever really visits was one of the neighbors when he was drunk. He would just grab one of the old recliners until he sobered up. Now every year my friends talk about spending another weekend there, but I always make up an excuse so we never go through that again, and they never know what actually happened.
Thanks for listening if you stuck around to this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to be notified when future episodes come out. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. You can stalk me on Twitter, you can stalk me on Facebook, and you can also stalk me on Instagram. All of these links are below. What's going on guys? I hope you enjoyed this episode. It was supposed to be another title. It was supposed to be something different, but I did not have enough stories to use for the Craigslist and the roommate story still. I need more, more of the stories. So you have to enjoy and get what you get. And what you get is the true scary story. These were another true scary story. So when I pick a theme, or come up with a theme that I want to do next. I try obviously to find a bunch of stories and right now I'm still waiting uh, to get some more so we can do Craigslist and roommate stories. That'll hopefully, hopefully be the next episode. And then we'll probably do some winter stories, then Christmas and all that fun stuff. So just be on the lookout for that. Uh, hopefully today as well, I'm going to have some merch finally done. I'll leave that in the description as well. Once that's done, if you're consider, if you're thinking about maybe getting some of that, cool. If you don't, you don't, no big deal either way. Uh, I think that's it. Again, next week, hopefully Craigslist and roommate stories. So be on the lookout for that. And I'm going to try to put out at least one or two shorts today as well. So if you follow the shorts channel, then you'll see those on there. I think that's it. See you guys in the next one. Cheers. Pew, pew, pew.